For those of you who weren't here yesterday, I'm Diane Zorich. I'm the director of the Digitization Program Office. Um, I don't have any special logistical notes to relay today, so that's great. But I do want to thank everybody who was here yesterday and all our speakers who were amazing. Um, I was thinking last night of some of the key issues that came up in the talks yesterday, the key themes, I guess, if you will. And um, the ones that resonated with me, I'm sure you have additional ones, but the ones that resonated with me were the intricacy and interplay between openness and impact, how they seem to often go hand in hand. Um, the use of collections to inform design and engineering and innovation, um, and to look at changes over time and uh, the issues of partnerships and how when Brian Matthews, our keynote, was talking about how we need to look at partners as uh, somebody who comes together with you to solve a common problem, um, that would be a true partnership and that there's a lot more people who would come to the table if we came to them with a common problem. So that was, I thought, interesting. But then that led me to his comment that we need to digitize all the things because um, for at least the engineering issues, it's great to be able to have huge data sets to apply things like machine learning to develop new and innovative um, creative solutions to some problems, innovation or engineering problems. So, um, and then we had a new tool introduced yesterday, which I think will be incredible for our field, the uh, Europeana's Impact Tool, which I urge all of you to look at. I, I reviewed it briefly, and it, it looks quite phenomenal. It'd be interesting for us here at the Smithsonian to start actually putting into play itself and seeing how it works out for our uh, efforts to try to achieve greater impact. I have the honor today of uh, introducing our keynote speaker who comes in at a time where I think after yesterday with all the discussions about digitizing collections for, uh, and specimen collections for engineering and innovative solutions is coming in just at the right time in this conference. Uh, I would like to uh, introduce to you Professor Ian Owens who is the Director of Science at the Natural History Museum in London. And he, joined, he became director in uh, October of 2011. He joined the museum from the Imperial College in London where he was head of the life sciences. He, was, uh, he had previously worked at the Institute of Zoology in London and at the University of Queensland in Australia. And he's got an extensive involvement with learned societies, government, and non-government agencies. Uh, as director of science, Professor Owens oversees the work of over 300 scientists. Uh, who are based at the museum. He sets the strategic direction of the museum's scientific activities, and that includes ensuring that the museum meets its national and international responsibilities and the wider needs of society. He's responsible for the museum's vast scientific, scientific collection of 70 million specimens from all parts of the world. In his interests, his personal research interests are in large-scale patterns of biodiversity, ecological impacts of climate change, genetics of wild populations, speciation and diversification, and phylogeny and ecology of extinction. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Ian Owens. Thank you very much, Diane, for that um, generous introduction. It's always a pleasure to come to the Smithsonian. I spend quite a lot of time here, particularly at the um, Natural History Museum um, each year, but I really admire what the Smithsonian is now doing in terms of pushing digitization across different types of collections, different fields of study, and so on. It's not news to you that there aren't many institutions around the world that can look at digitization and its impacts through so many different um, lenses. So it's great to be here as you guys are um, starting to do that. So I, um, I call this talk um, the new enlightenment. Um, so I didn't want to be too modest about what we're trying to do. Um, but really what I'm thinking here is that the sort of institutions that a lot of us work in were formed usually a couple of hundred years or so ago at the end of um, the enlightenment period. And I see them really as, as many of them around the world as direct products of that period. That was a period when people started to develop a new way of understanding the world that was based on data, evidence, rational debate, and so on. 
one of the prime pieces of evidence for that global culture, understanding global culture, was bringing objects together to show people what the world was like. And certainly the museum um, that I work for, the Natural History Museum in London, is very much made in that image. It's based upon the foundations of um, the British Museum. And the one thing we have to do at the British Museum is to make our collections available, as you can see here, for the learned and the curious. And I think that's a key phrase, for the learned and the curious. The learned are obviously experts. Many of us, I think, in our fields will be considered the learned, and our colleagues are the learned. And we spend a lot of time making sure we make these collections available to them. The curious, to me, is the rest of the global population, people that might be inspired by seeing our collections. And the reason that I think this is such an exciting time for us as a community, and the reason why I refer to this as the new enlightenment, is I think that this is a time when there are new ways of understanding the world rapidly becoming available. Then they're often, at the moment, largely known by elites, by the learned, and yet digital technologies allow them to be available to a complete global population. Very similar to what was happening a couple of years ago. Very similar to why we were founded, but of course now we have a completely different bag of tools to play with, and we have some new global challenges to address. So I really think that we are entering a new enlightenment um, period, if we can capture that opportunity. <clears throat> so museums like our own are often best known for these sorts of specimens. What I often refer to as specimens that change the way we think. In the case of our museum, it's largely about the natural world and humans' place in that natural world. But I'm conscious across our different types of institution, we have lots of objects or specimens or data that have changed the way that humanity has thought about their place in the world. So we want to release this sort of information to the world. We want to continue to use these objects to inspire people. I spent, as Diane said, I spent 20, more than 20 years teaching in universities. I became the classic professor that would typically get a big stack of PowerPoint slides and try and, try and transmit information to long-suffering groups of students. <laughs> what I realize now is that taking one of these objects out of the collection and putting it on a table there, talking to them, talking to a group of um, either um, university-level students or even school students, within a few moments, you're guaranteed to capture their minds and get them thinking about things which didn't work with 20 or, th three, 20 or 30 PowerPoint slides. It's incredibly powerful objects if you can put them in people's heads or put them in people's hands. There's another side to these collections, though, you know. It is, we're not just um, trying to digitize a dozen or so specimens. We have collections and data at a great scale. When you start to think about the number of specimens multiplied by the amount of metadata associated with them, and particularly with that, then when we start to think about the potential links across those collections, this is big data. This is a picture from the Natural History Museum, sorry, the, I always call it the Natural History Museum, um, the London Natural History Museum. Um, this is part of our beetle collection. We have tens of millions of beetles, building up to a collection, as Diane said, of, a, of about 80 million specimens, each of which comes with a whole array of metadata fields. Not only that, but if you look in the bottom right-hand corner there, often that metadata appears to be almost consciously hidden. There you can see um, an insect on the end of a pin, and under it, a series of labels. The key data about that specimen is on those labels. It's about the most analog thing you can possibly see at the moment, particularly in an institution like a museum. So one of our, one of our tasks is to make these sorts of collections um, compute to make these sorts of com collections computable. As you'll see um, in the final slide, I would estimate at the moment there's between two and four billion specimens of this type, natural history specimens around the world. How are we going to liberate that data? <clears throat> so what I'm going to try to do today is I'll show you some of the things that we are doing at the Natural History Museum in London. Um, as an illustration, I think hopefully some of those will be of interest to quite a few of you. But then I'll also go on and try to illustrate how we're measuring things like impact and what we're looking to in the future. I'll start off by showing you some of our dirty laundry. 
as we call it in the UK. Here's our dirty laundry. We've got about 80 million specimens, as I said. Actually, and you can see here roughly how those specimens are distributed across our different major collection areas. One of the things that you'll see, we've got 80 million specimens. We've got about 1.2 million type specimens, which in biological studies um, are very important. You can then see how many of those we've actually got a line written down somewhere in analog form about that specimen. You'll immediately see there's only about 5 million of those 80 million specimens. We have a, we think we have, a written line of information. That, that immediately leads you to back to the first number and say, if you've only got about 5 million data entries in registries, registers and so on, how do you know you've got 80 million specimens? We don't really know that. We have 5 million, we probably have about 5 million lines of data. The right-hand column there tells you what we can really compute, what we can really use to manage our collections and to start to make them available. At this stage in 2014, less than 3 million of those specimens have a real line in a database. If you're going to be particular and say, is it a computable line with something like a geographical coordinate that a normal person could use, wasn't an expert in linguistics or geographical regions or something, there's probably about half a million such specimens with that type of computable data. So a massive challenge, a massive opportunity, but a massive challenge to liberate that. And that's just one museum, a big one, but it's several museums of this scale around the world. So a few years ago, <coughs> we created our digital collections program. We set ourselves what our trustees like to think of as a big, hairy, audacious target to liberate these specimens, to make this information available to the world, to organize it and so on. A very Google-esque type um, ambition, you can see here. And we decided that we were going to try to do about 20 million specimens in the first 10 years. Why that number? So I set, this, I set this number as an ambitious target. But part of the reason I set this sort of number was to think about what the rest of the world was doing. And I said, if we're not making very substantial fractions of our collection available in digital shareable form over the next 10 years, then people will not turn to our data. They will try to find other sources of data. So some of this is practical. We have to liberate this data if we want it to have the sort of influence we want it to have. So this is the ambition that we set ourselves. I won't go through this in detail, but we, what we did is we identified different areas of our business that we wanted to change, and we set ourselves two, five, and 10-year um, goals in each one of those areas. This was incredibly useful, painful, argumentative, but useful. Because what it allowed us to do was to identify those different business areas and set ourselves two years what we're going to do now. Five years where we should be getting to within the current funding stream within our museum. Ten years where we want to get to in a reasonable period of time. <clears throat> We've achieved most of the um, goals within the first two years. We're now in that second year, sorry, in that second tranche, the five-year tranche. And of course, that's where you need serious collaboration and serious funding to be able to make the difference. Been very useful to us, this framework. <clears throat> so what have we been doing? In that first two-year period, we set up a lot of pilot digitization projects, as we call them. This was for us to try to understand what challenges and what opportunities are ahead and what technologies are available with respect to our types of collection. So for example, we um, tried to develop high-speed digitization pipelines for physically digitizing um, objects. We did quite a lot of work, as you'll see in a moment, on trying to extract information from labels. That's become probably our biggest challenge, the label ext um, data extraction from labels. We created an open data portal, which I'll tell you about um, in a few minutes. At the time we started this work, I would say it was almost impossible to get to our museum's data. Even if you were on the inside and you were apparently in charge of the group, there are about 20 or 30 different databases hidden to varying degrees on the internet on varying degrees of um, functionality. Again, it wasn't analog, but it was as far away from open as you could imagine. Also, our trustees and so on had a lot of concerns about open data, what that meant with respect to commercialization and so on. So in the science area, that required us not just to build a nice portal, but to push through 
all of the all the all of the difficulties that you know are involved in making an open culture. We also started working on born digital collections. We started collecting things in the field and making sure that with respect to both digital and genomic information, they didn't add to our backlog, but came in um, digital. We started exploring text mining, in particular uh, mining information from our labels, but the beginnings of linking label information with um, the literature and so on. And of course, we tried to digitize a couple of large scale collections. Large here means a million or so specimens. So that's what we've been doing in the last um, couple of years, playing with these six areas. <clears throat> Some great successes. As with the Natural History Museum here, we've been collaborating um, with a company called Picture A, who have really developed a technique for digitizing um, herbarium sheets. So when many of you were um, younger, you may have pressed flowers. Um, I'm an ornithologist, so I often say this. Botanical collections are not so different from that. You get a flower, you get a nice three-dimensional plant, and you cr crush it down to a two-dimensional object. The great thing about that, apart from the fact you can um, save it, also means that it becomes the sort of um, specimen that can be digitized using techniques that have been particularly developed around libraries and archives. And that means you can accelerate that. The picture ray workflows are based around conveyor belts, um, single specimen um, photography, high resolution photography, then extracting the information um, through a combination typically of crowdsourcing and with a dedicated pool of um, transcribers. This works great. You have a couple of these pipelines running, you can do tens of thousands of specimens a day. So for this, for herbarium collections at least, I think that we can do these around the world in the next few years if that's what we choose to prioritize. It's a great idea. The challenge is, as you've probably already seen with some of our specimens, not all of our specimens are easy to crush into two dimensionals, into two dimensions while still retaining the information that you might want in them. Some of them also are very small, so normal high resolution photography designed for archives and so on um, aren't so um, suitable. Some of the collections look like this. For us, millions and millions and millions of Lepidoptera. Relatively two dimensional objects, I'd prefer that we don't crush them, but there is a plane in them that we can photograph quite nicely. Quite a lot of information on that upper surface, so that's great. The problem with these is that all the information about that specimen is on labels underneath it, so you need to get at those labels. <clears throat> there are other things that are relatively two-dimensional and relatively straightforward as well. So, for example, we've been doing quite a lot of work on uh, microscope slides um, recently, which are much smaller, but again, there are technologies from the biomedical industry to extract information from those images, putting in large cassettes of slides and so on. And again, we can churn through these at the rates of at least um, thousands a day. Given the collections are typically less than um, a million or so, or just over a million, that means there's practical approaches to this. So for some types of collection, I would say there are already practical approaches available, technically practical approaches to obtaining images. For other sorts of collections though, there are more substantial difficulties. And I would say that certainly we're at the stage at the moment where we haven't cracked those technologies so that we can go fast enough, cheaply enough at the moment. The classic one of those are those pinned insects where the labels are hidden underneath the specimen. We've been doing a lot of work recently um, on image processing. Here is a classic rig that's in the, this is Daisy, that's in our um, rig, in our um, laboratories at the moment. So what this does briefly is it captures images from all, from all around a particular specimen. That then allows you to reconstruct lots of, um, lots of um, images, not of the specimen, but really in these cases of the labels underneath that specimen. That allows us to gradually reconstruct that specimen and you can use standard OCR or sometimes other forms of analysis to extract information from that. <clears throat> now this is not a conveyor belt system at the moment. This is a static system that you would take, an a human would take the specimen out of a tray, put it in the middle of daisy, press another button and push it and put it back. So it's not automated. To automate it probably requires a conveyor belt and perhaps some robotics for some systems, but already this is an order of magnitude quicker than we could go with previous systems because we're piecing together the information very quickly. Also, we don't need to touch the, the labels very much. We just need to touch the overall pin on the specimen. So we're starting to find the types of technology that we need for these sorts of things. 
Typically, what we do in these sorts of situations is if the label turns out to be typewritten in a reasonable form, we would then pass that on to OCR. With the set of OCR tools that are currently available, you can read a lot of text in these sorts of systems. And we have pipelines for turning most sorts of images like that into, into text writing, um, computable text writing pretty quickly. Of course, the other problem that you're fully aware of is that not all um, label information is text written. A lot of it is handwritten, and a lot of it is handwritten in ways that is very difficult for us to read using current computer technology. That's where crowdsourcing comes in. <clears throat> Often, the challenge is we've got a specimen, we've got various types of labels associated with it, and we need to extract information from them. What we can pass across to an OCR pipeline, that's what we usually do. What we can't, rather than using our own curators, who are usually looking after these projects and looking after the data, rather than doing the transcriptions themselves, we try to pass the remaining information to a crowd of some sort. We've tried to build crowds and technologies ourselves, but what we've really found is that a crowd is something that you should share. We don't have enough projects running all of the time or enough um, relationships, if you like, to build our own crowd and maintain it all the time. So we are now trying to share crowds and do collaborative projects of this sort. We've done a fair bit of stuff um, with um, the Zooniverse platform, um, where there's the Notes for Nature uh, project, which basically allows you to pick your collection. Once you've obtained the um, images of the labels, you can then serve it to this platform and process it reasonably well. It's a great, it's a great platform, at least for uh, medium-sized projects. Today, um, there's a big project um, through the NSF-funded iDig Bio project called WeDigBio, which is a global effort um, to digitize um, collections using crowdsourcing. I know the Smithsonian's Transcription Center are one of the big partners. Another big partner in France, and organizations like us are also going into that. That's us really sharing a crowd, sharing a platform, and sharing approaches into this sort of information. I think it's the way forward, not just in terms of technology, but in terms of getting a global community involved. If you check out the WeDigBio um, Twitter feed this morning, or you look on their site, you'll see they've got a map as different people around the world start to digitize collections. So you'll see the Smithsonian's, the Smithsonian's collections being digitized right at the beginning of the calendar day by people in New Zealand, and gradually that timeline moving across the earth as people get involved in digitizing the collections here in Washington. It's a great way of engaging people. I'd say the next phase of this really is to understand the data around what we're crowdsourcing and about the crowd. You can see this is some of our data from our crowds, who's doing what, how to encourage people to do it, and so on. I think there's some really interesting human biology and human psychology to look at here of how to encourage people to do this sort of work. If I had a caution right now, it would be I think these sort of crowdsourcing projects, for us at least, have been fantastic of getting people interested in our collections. If, however, we want a mechanism that can suddenly transcribe millions and millions of labels, at the moment, we don't have a crowdsourcing um, platform that can do that. I would say that we can photograph specimens in labels about an order of magnitude quicker than we can crowdsource the data from them. So there's a, a data gap there at the moment. I'll be interested to see whether crowdsourcing um, remains a way of engaging people primarily or becomes a really high throughput way of grabbing data from these sorts of collections. <clears throat> and I mentioned the challenges of open data. For us, this was a very big deal. It took us more or less the full two years to be able to have an, a, a proper open data policy um, at the museum for us to start to use that intelligently to know what, which things would not fall under open data. And then actually building the portal and making that information available was much quicker than that. So the policy and the institutional behavior took longer than the technology. We now have this portal. It's, we serve our data through it at the moment. My vision for the future is that we would have portals like that between different institutions, and it doesn't have to, it's nice to brand it for a particular institution, but we would share this sort of approach. Interestingly, talking about trying to track um, data from these um, sorts of um, uh, projects. We put this up about 18 months ago, 
Previous to that, as I say, it was extremely hard to extract our information. It was more or less easier to come to London and ask us to take away a sheet. Since putting this information up, it's been downloaded um, six billion times to date. At the moment, it's being downloaded by, if you exclude the people within our museum, because this has become like our Google. If I want collection information, I don't go through my portals, I go through this. It's quicker than our internal information systems. So it's our Google. So exclude us, exclude people like me trying to figure out where Archaeopteryx is at the moment. If you look at people from outside the museum who are using this, our museum, um, you've got hundreds of people um, using this. We've also started tracking where they're putting it in terms of data citations and where it's coming out as papers as well. Um, so I see this, a collaborative version of this, as the, one of the approaches for tracking the impact of use of collections data, particularly this kind of mass science data. What would that global portal eventually look like, do you think? Well, I mentioned at the beginning that the fact that um, herbarium sheets are flat or can be, made, uh, can be made flat has accelerated their use greatly because you can start using um, what the libraries and the archives have been doing for a long time. Exactly the same with respect to these sorts of portals. Hopefully everybody here knows about the um, Global Biodiversity Heritage Library, BHL, um, hosted here, global collaboration of these sorts of institutions with a great open portal, focusing on historical um, literature or associated with biodiversity. So it's a, it's a particular type of collection. But what I see here is the way that this is being linked around the world in a collaborative way and is being downloaded by lots of different sorts of user groups. At the moment, this is for literature, because literature came first. I would love to see one of these for beetles and for other types of collections. There's so much to be learnt from this, so we shouldn't, we shouldn't try and build a brand new way of doing these things when we already have really good practice. So what do you do with this sort of data? What's the impact of it? In our sort of world, the first line of impact is often things like this. So imagine I showed you, I've shown you lots of labels which have got information on them about um, what the species is, what the specimen is in our world, who collected it, when they collected it, and where they collected it. So if you like, you've got a kind of a little, um, you've got a known occurrence of a specimen or a species at a particular location. Now remember, for our types of collections, we typically have that then going back about 300 years a unique time machine to explore the Anthropocene, the period that humans have been changing, the Western humans have been changing uh, the planet. So you can use that to create maps like this of Africa. Surveying African plant biology right now would be an, um, would be an amazingly challenging prospect. Imagine what that would take to go across Africa and survey all parts of it, and then to try and extrapolate back 300 years, what it looked like in the past. Many billions of dollars, incredible political hurdles. It's probably not possible from field work right now. With the sorts of collections that we have in our institutions, you can recreate these biodiversity patterns and you can even extrapolate into the past. Here's an example um, for plants in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa. And what you can see there is um, red is relatively low diversity. Blue is high diversity of the plants that are there. Now you see that little um, blue spot um, up around the, um, in West Africa, around the Gulf there. That's a well-known biodiversity hotspot for plants. So, the, so this reconfirms there's a hotspot there, and you can see how that's changed with different um, people living through that region. The one in Eastern Africa, around the lakes there, that's a new hotspot for these plants. We didn't previously know of that hotspot. It turns out that it's for probably for different sorts of plants that are normally picked up on ecological surveys. So already with this sort of, um, with this sort of evidence coming out of, um, directly out of herbarium collections, you're finding out new things about African biodiversity that has very direct influences on policy and conservation and so on. And that is just the tip of the iceberg. This is just a few groups working together with the herbarium information that's currently available. Armed with that sort of information, of course, then you can start to look across the world and figure out which areas of the world have retained most of their biodiversity and which areas have lost most of their biodiversity. This is one of the first global maps based on that sort of, um, based on that sort of question. So here, the blue areas are those that have retained 
more of their biodiversity, more of their biodiversity intact. The red are the areas that have lost most of their biodiversity. This is over the last um, few hundred years during this Western Anthropocene period. Many of those areas will be familiar with you. You can see in North America the intense agriculture across the middle of the country. You can see in Australia the introduction of um, rodents, um, sorry, of um, rabbits and predators and so on, decimating much of their marsupial uh, diversity. You see Southern Africa and so on. You can also see some areas on this map where there's still a lot of biodiversity um, left. So you can find new patterns of biodiversity. You can quantify humanity's impact on our planet for this particular um, parameter. I mentioned before that museum, museum collections can be a time machine into the past. They can potentially also be a time machine into the future if you've got the right algorithms to try and to learn from the past and into the future. Here's an example of doing that. This graph here shows time going backwards along that, ex along that um, horizontal axis from slightly into the future back to 1500. On the vertical axis there, you can see relative um, biodiversity, with zero being set to the um, level in about 1500. The black line there with the gray confidence intervals around it show the estimation from museum collections and other sources of how biodiversity has changed during that period. You can see that big drop is all to do, that's the Anthropocene, if you like. That's humans changing the way that forests and lands are used. Chopping down forests, putting in agriculture, not very much regeneration. When people talk about a biodiversity crisis, that's that on a graph, if you like, put in the context of the last few hundred years. Pretty grim if you just show people that part of the graph. But what I think is really interesting about that are the lines that come off the right there. Each of these are models into the future under different sorts of assumptions with respect to how many people there are, how we're using fossil fuels, um, how we are replanting areas of the world. Now, when we started doing this work, this work, we thought that all of these lines would go downwards. Everything was going to be bad. The red line is basically business as usual. We thought it would all be like that. In fact, you can see from these lines, they're not all going down. Instead, some of them, even within a relatively short period of time, are starting to go up. Now, that's through particular uses of energy, particular forms of deforestation, and a relatively stable number of humans on the planet. But you can see, so those are big things to try and influence. But you can see from these sorts of models, if you can influence those things, you can change biodiversity within human generations. Within 50 years, you can make an impact. I see, those, I see those graphs at the end there as incredibly hopeful, that if you make the right decisions now, you can have a better future. Now, that's based ultimately on museum specimens, allowing you to figure out what the past looks like, how the past has changed, build a mathematical model to understand that, and then extrapolate into the future. Museums predicting the future to influence hopeful policies. We've also done, I think, some really interesting things with respect to getting the public involved in this sort of work. This is not work that was run through our museum. This is work that we collaborated with the university, University of Sheffield in the north of England, um, to, to do quite a technical task, which was to digitize a large number of bills from beak or beaks from birds from our collections, to use some pretty fancy 3D imaging software to quantify the shape of those bills, and then to use those in evolutionary models to figure out how evolution works, how ecology and evolution interact, and so on. The thing about this was, with the resources available, they could take the photographs of the bird bills, but they didn't have enough resource to be able to do all of the, um, all of the, um, the work on the different um, birds' bills in terms of putting the um, landmarks on the bills and measuring the different dimensions and so on. They used crowdsourcing to do that. A huge crowdsourcing campaign was set up using a lot of social media, a lot of competitions and games to get people involved in this. They did this through crowdsourcing. A lot of the science here is crowdsourcing. Subsequently, they've gone on to publish a paper, a big paper about this in the journal called Nature, which in the scientific world is a big deal. It's one of the big, nature and science are considered two of the big papers out there. So this is crowdsourcing directly making that sort of scientific contribution which wouldn't have been done otherwise. 
The other thing we've noticed, of course, is that when we create these sorts of digital resources, often as practicing scientists, we're using it for these sorts of scientific studies, modeling biodiversity or something like that. In fact, the assets, the digital assets that we create are often used much, much more broadly than that. So for example, at our museum, we recently brought this Stegosaurus in um, to put into um, one of our halls, became a star exhibit in one of our halls. We did a 3D image of it before we 3D model of it before we um, put it into the hall. That 3D image now is used throughout our museum with respect to communication, commercial products, the web, um, and so on. There's a new book that's come out uh, meant for the next generation, if you like, of dinosaur hunters. It makes extremely heavy use of that model, not just looking at it, but the articulation of that model in order to inspire the next generation, in this case of paleontologists. So, the, so these, particularly the um, younger groups that we're, talking, that we're talking to, often expect us to have these sorts of assets and to be able to play with it. Recently, some of you might be aware that we ripped out the central hall in our museum. We had a Diplodocus cast in there. We sent that on a tour around the country. We've installed a new blue whale in there to start to talk about the effect of humans on the future of um, the planet. Now, again, we used, um, we did digital models of this before we um, installed the whale. And subsequently, we're now using this extremely extensively across our different sorts of um, audience. So people love coming into the hall they see this amazing blue whale. Usually it's very satisfying. It's, they usually gasp. They usually take photographs of it. But the next thing they want to do is they want to be able to interact with it in different ways. So they immediately start using the app to look at different aspects of the um, biology of the whale. They then um, go onto the web, use the web to look at longer stories and so on. So the link between our star objects in the galleries and both our um, bring your own technology and your main platform technology is now incredibly intimate. The connection across those is tightening and tightening. Quite challenging, but very important for us. And another area, of course, and the whale brings this to uh, mind, is that we quite often want to use what we call bleeding edge technologies to bring these sorts of things to life. If it's a 3D articulated model of a whale or a, or a stegosaurus or something like that, we can usually manage that within our own laboratories. If we want to do bleeding edge VR or even augmented reality, that's something that we would really struggle at doing ourselves or even using a traditional project structure. So what we're doing now is we typically collaborate with industrial partners on those sorts of projects. So for example, as the museum um, here did, um, we collaborated with um, Google on their um, cultural um, program. And in particular, uh, Google came in, um, photographed some of our objects, used the 3D models that we have, and created some Google Cardboard um, visualization models for that. An amazing hit with the schools that we took that to. To take to them a little bit of cardboard, put somebody's phone inside that, and then transport them into oceans hundreds of billions of years ago with this animal swimming around in front of them, and of lurching towards them and then telling them a story about the importance of the oceans. It was a great collaboration, but I think it, at its heart was that link between ourselves, knowing about the specimen, providing a digital model of the specimen, and then Google coming in with their expertise of how to create a, v, a VR experience of that and to distribute it by a cardboard. It was great. Subsequently, we've also done some in museum uh, work as well, where we've been working with companies um, like Atlantic to digitize um, other fossil collections, to create a, a life version of that, and to give people a full immersive experience of um, ancient oceans. So people can go swim through an ocean with David Attenborough telling them about what they're seeing. At various points, it breaks out to show them big visualizations of the tree of life and so on. Now, again, that's very exciting to look at, and our scientists have been heavily involved in talking about the organisms, the specimens, their world, what Attenborough might say during that show. But that was done in collaboration with Atlantic, doing the actual um, VR and um, filming production, and Samsung providing us with the apparatus we were actually using within the museums. Now, that collaboration made that possible within six months or so. My guess is that if we were trying to do that totally in-house, we'd probably still be discussing how one might go about it. In both of these cases, this took six months or so, 
These guys did that in a matter of weeks once we'd given them the model and discussed what it was. So it's really accelerating um, what we can do in this field. Okay, so just two slides to um, close with now. What would I say the future looks like? We've talked about lots of things that are in track at the moment. I guess there are two things I particularly see as important for the future. One I often refer to as putting the museum inside people's pockets. One of the things that I would love to do, the Natural History Museum here, ourselves, other museums around the world, we have an amazing baseline of knowledge about the natural world. We have experts in those museums, which are now probably the world repositories of that sort of information in many ways. To make that sustainable and to get it outside these kind of hallowed walls, we have to get it into normal people's pockets in a way that they want to use it. Now, here's a slide we often use when we're talking to various technology companies. And the point of this is really to say, you see that bit in the middle there, that specimen and the digital information around that? We can do that reasonably well now. And that's great. We've spent a few years managing to do that. To do it across entire collections is still a big challenge, but my guess is we can do that. Everything around there, however, are different sorts of information technology. The museum should not be reinventing all of this themselves. They need to be collaborating with each other and collaborating with industry to free this information up so it can be consumed in all sorts of ways, in all sorts of audiences that we barely know about at the moment. So I would love to have, say, some, some kid in Kenya interested in natural history. They could get an app like this. They could find something like this and have the equivalent of talking to an expert in the museum across the mall, who knows an amazing amount often about East African biodiversity. But at the moment, there's a lot of steps between that child knowing about that information and being able to extract it from that museum to free that up. The other thing, of course, is the global collaboration. The reason that I particularly wanted to come here and see what um, you were doing and have the opportunity to talk with you is I think that a lot of these sorts of collections make most sense if you put them together. Our forebears, if you, went, if you like, went off around the world, collected, thing cra collected things crazily from Africa, Australia, South America, and so on. They brought them back into our capital cities, typically around the world, for the Enlightenment. Our duty now, I think, is to put those collections back together and to share them globally. Now, that's a big challenge. You know what it's like at the Smithsonian? We have similar issues here in London. That's a big challenge even to do within an, within an institution. But I really don't want us to set up our own systems. We have to eventually be looking towards linking those systems together. So Maureen Kearney, who will talk through it in a few minutes um, from the Natural History Museum here, we often look at this sort of data. This is data from global natural history museums, just natural history museums at the moment. We estimate there's probably about 7,000 collections in the world. There's probably about two to four billion specimens around the world. Unambiguously, the biggest set of data on this planet with respect, to with respect to the natural world. Unambiguously, the only time machine we've got for going back the last 300 years or even the last four billion years. And the key part of predicting the future as well. So an amazing intellectual asset. But it's very challenging to bring that together. So what I think we need is we do need an information system eventually that can bring this together to allow us to create the new enlightenment. Thank you for your time. It's a pleasure to talk to you. <laughs>
and maintains a research program as a curator of entomology at the Natural History Museum. And you've already met Ian. Thank you for that talk. Um, Ian, you raised so many um, interesting ideas and some impacts and inspiring future for collections and also some challenges for museums in entering this world of digitization and big data, not to mention the new enlightenment. Um, so first, I'd like to ask the panelists to react to your talk from your perspectives and roles that you have, your thoughts about what Ian presented. What did you take away from his talk? Would you like to start? Sure. I'm going to start really by talking about a perspective from the arts and humanities, but also from libraries, because before coming here, I was at the British Library in the UK and the British Museum before that. And I think what I... Much of what I was going to say, Ian's already said, so I'm going to have to redo my talk slightly on the fly. <laughs> but you'll be pleased to know I've written it on library index cards, which is something I've taken to doing because it kind of reminds me that so much of the data that we have about our collections is still in this kind of format. You know, we've got all these amazing digitization projects going, but there are real challenges. And the challenges are often about scale. Not that this is a competition, but the British Library's got 150 million books. And that's not even counting the newspapers, the manuscripts, and the data sets, because they archive the internet. So being there for a while was a real education in how to think at scale. It was also interesting because of the way libraries, and those of you who know libraries will know all about this, have been reinventing the idea of what a library is as a space as well as a repository, a physical space and a digital space. So a library as a place that convenes and connects as well as having collections. And I think that's been really powerful for me, and I now bring that back into museums because it's a slightly different way of thinking that equips us well for the digital and for the digitized work that we need to do. So just on digitization briefly, I'd entirely agree with Ian that scaling up is crucial. If we're spending $20 per image, per object, we can never do millions of objects. So we have to make it quicker and cheaper without compromising getting what we need from the digitization. Early library digitization projects often, not always, produced images that we now have to redo because they were at low quality, they weren't what was needed. So we can learn from that. We can make sure we're doing it quickly, but in the right way now. The interesting challenge we faced in the British Library as well was how to choose what to digitize from such a big collection. Selection involves deciding what your audiences need from you. And if audiences' needs are changing because digital research is changing quickly, then that involves skilling up the curatorial teams as well as resourcing things like technical infrastructure, project management, and the kind of workflows that Ian saw. So it's a whole institution change to do this at scale. And it's a whole institution question about what the impact of that is. One of the other things I found really interesting about being in a library, and I mentioned this when I talked about web archiving, is they're much further ahead than museums in born digital collecting. So archiving software and websites and thinking about how to preserve those and thinking about what meaningful access to them is. But I think one thing that nobody's quite cracked yet, but it is increasingly pressing, is how to combine born digital collections with digitized collections, but maintain a sense that they're not the same thing. I find quite often people think digitized includes born digital, and I'd like to make the case that you have to think differently about the two, but make sure they connect together. But we're here to talk about digitization, so I won't go on about that, although I could. <laughs> Big thing as well for libraries that really, I knew when I went there, but have become even more conscious of now, is discoverability is a keyword for libraries. If you've got millions of digitized pages or millions of digitized beetles or petabytes of digital collections data, you need a way to get through that. And that's not just about searchability because discoverability for me isn't passive. If you pump out digitized content, that doesn't necessarily mean people will come and use it. So discoverability is active. It's about thinking about how people will want to access it and what they're going to need to give them the, the structure and the framework to get into the data. And a fact on that that continues to blow my mind and should also blow yours is the protocols by which libraries share collections metadata is older than the web. <laughs> 
They've been sharing metadata about collections since before there were collection databases and since before there were websites. That's extraordinary. And it says something about how much libraries care about connecting people to information. We've got some catching up to do, but we can also learn from that. I think there's something really powerful about that. And then just to finish, I want to talk a little bit about digital scholarship, which Ian talked about as well. If you think about museum collections and library collections, what we've got is what data scientists might call multimodal data. Other people might call it big, messy, and complicated data. But I think some of that is also really interesting as a challenge, but preserving some of the complexity of our data, but finding tools for analysis across types of material is where there's real potential, not just in the humanities, but in the sciences. And digital research is one of the value propositions that's made for digitization. People say, we've got to digitize because of research. But I'd like our institutions to take a bit more seriously the way that that then changes the institutions themselves. Digital research places new demands because researchers want different kinds of things from us. It places different demands not only on how we think about our work, but what we do in terms of public engagement for the research community. But interestingly, the thing I think we could do more to work together on, and this also links to what Ian was talking about, is we can use some of the tools to help our own work with collections. You know, we can use machine learning, perhaps, to identify photographic collections at scale and stop having to have one person with one photograph with one computer going, this is a picture of York Minster. Um, and that would be really powerful because it would scale up in some of the ways that Ian was talking about. So I'll stop there and, and hand over, but I think, basically, I, I, I agree, which is disappointing, because I think we were meant to be a little bit more controversial and create some debate, but I think, Huge potential, but huge challenges. Um, I, I fundamentally agree with everything that Ian said <laughs> as well. And I want to really congratulate his museum for what they've accomplished. And, and I, know I started going, I started regular visits to their insect collection in 1985. So I know how far <laughs> that, they've, that they've come. And I'll also add that while they have all the same sort of fundamental challenges and issues as our Natural History Museum here at the Smithsonian, it's even more so because they have so much more older material that has those cryptic nasty labels and, and, and such things. Um, so you know, thinking about impact, I wanted to make a few comments on prioritization and, and audiences. And um, I'll start by again saying something nice about libraries. Um, I think the Biodiversity Heritage Library Project is an amazing example of libraries coming together around a joint set of priorities and coordinating around that in a way that I wish the Natural History Museum community could. Um, and there's a variety of reasons in that ecosystem why that's a, a, a challenge. I think one, you know, there's, there's clear examples, including in London and in Washington, of great successes of individual natural history museums uh, making progress. There's a few examples of like VertNet of natural history museums working together, but it's always been a challenge for natural history museums to come together on a set of priorities at scale. And some of that is the diversity of the sort of forms of ownership and governance of those museums themselves, which results in um, quite different priorities. But I think one of the results of that is that while there is a huge amount of museum-based data that is in digital form and is, is concatenated by organizations like um, GBIF, that data, when you look at it at scale, is essentially random, and uh, most of those records are of unknown quality. Um, so I think there's a long way to go as a community, and I know certainly both of these natural history museums are involved in yet another attempt to bring that community um, together. But I wanted to talk about sort of two examples of extremes of, of priorities. And clearly, we digitize for a whole lot of reasons, including you know, accountability and, and whatnot else. But you know, one reason to digitize these kinds of, of biological collections is taxonomy and classification and a basic understanding of the evolution of critters. That's interesting because we pretty much know the questions that researchers are going to want to ask of that of that data. On the other hand, there's a huge amount of ecological information that's associated with those specimens. Ian gave some examples of some of those kinds of uses. 
But there it's actually a little more challenging because we don't know the kinds of questions that researchers will ask today or in 20 years. So when you think about it from the taxonomic community, a clear priority is the type specimens, the specimens on which the names are, are actually based. Um, and it does seem to me like that ought to be a global priority to actually stabilize the classification of, of critters, especially a lot of invertebrates. But you know, as a counter example, you find National Science Foundation has made a massive investment in digitizing biological collections. Um, that program will end 10 years of investment in 2021, but because of the way those priorities have been set, most of the animal type specimens in the United States will remain undigitized, um, or certainly not digitized with that NSF money. Um, on the other hand, if you're looking at ecological questions, um, some of the most interesting information on those specimens is the sort of field notes on the labels, particularly on herbarium specimens that you gave the example of. Um, you have you know, local names, flower color, all kinds of information that can be useful to all sorts of folks, including anthropologists. And yet, oftentimes, in the interests of sort of efficiency of pro, you know, cost e efficiency, that information isn't transcribed or is left out of, uh, of the process. So um, you know, all of those things kind of need to be taken into account. A um, Couple of comments on technical challenges, which, which Ian um, pointed out very well. Uh, there's, there's three big technical challenges that I, you know, I've put out to some of, you know, technology partners and, and others that I think could help us a lot. One of them is, um, Ian showed an example of an insect label that was actually really clear. A lot of them have cryptic abbreviations and all kinds of, of things so that you can get the data onto a little, little tiny piece of paper. Today, deciphering those kinds of things requires historic curatorial knowledge, but I think a lot of that could be, you know, there is a limited number of collecting events, even though there may seem like there's a an, an infinite number of insect specimens. Um, but I think that's something that can be, can be tackled in today's world. And moreover, you know, we have fantastic technologies out there um, in the national security and the, and the intelligence world to do things like track terrorists based on piecing together lots of disparate bits of information. And I think if we were to be able to apply that same kind of technologies to, for example, historic collectors, you would be able to pinpoint the places that they were and translate that back to um, the cryptic data on the, on the labels. So I think there's, and then you, you know, the flip side of that is you have that information then to be able to apply to climate change and, and other things. And then frankly, there is the really nasty problem there where we have millions of specimens who are in glass jars with, filled with alcohol who have labels floating around in there. Is there a technology that would allow us to image those labels without taking them out of the bottle? Um, the, um, I wanted to make a comment on open access, and this goes back in part to the keynote speaker um, yesterday morning who gave another excellent presentation. And clearly in the Smithsonian environment, we have a very complex intellectual properties sort of, of regime, and there's a lot of issues. But from a personal standpoint, I think that you know, we basically owe it to the US taxpayer to make information as available as we can. But even more importantly, you look at a natural history museum like at the Smithsonian or London, many and in many cases most of the specimens have actually originated from other countries and we really owe it to those countries to make that information available to them on an open access basis. Um, and just to, just to end, um, I know at this conference there's a lot of discussion of people wanting to do imaging better, faster, cheaper, more intensively, etc. And I think for a lot of biological specimens, while the image is nice, it's actually not enough. And we actually, for high value specimens, we ought to be thinking about taking samples for future DNA work. And it actually, in many of these collections, once you've handled the specimen, you've taken it out of its drawer, you've looked at its labels, you've done all those things, the incremental cost of taking a sample for DNA use, not doing the sequencing, but just making the sample, 
available for future use is actually um, not that much, and, and that's something certainly that the, the, um, uh, the, the GGBN, the Global Global Genome Biodiversity Network, yes, too many acronyms, um, is, is actually exploring. So I will, um, I will end there. Thank you. Ian, do you have anything in response to the response before we start with questions? Um, no, I don't have anything substantial to add. I think those are both um, excellent additional perspectives on the opportunities and challenges. The only other thing I would highlight um, would be the um, value of figuring out what audiences want. It goes back to the, um, the quote I put up at the beginning there about, for us, serving the learned and the curious. Um, I find that as a team, we spend a lot of time thinking about what the learned may require. We could probably do a little bit of a, um, more work with our external stakeholders on that. The curious, I think, um, um, we know less about them at the moment. So I would say we're at the stage now where amongst us we have quite a lot of this sort of digital information available. And I think it would be a great time to start to figure out what the public would like to do with our data, what educational programs would like to do with our data, and start making some tools for them as well. Okay. Um, so we heard a lot of love for um, libraries and BHL in particular. And so I was wondering um, whether the panelists, any of you or all of you, um, have thoughts about what we can learn there to not repeat past mistakes in the goals that we have for digitizing natural history museums. Any thoughts on what the differences are, the major successes from the libraries, and things that we can learn from that and going forward? Um, I think part of it, as Katie said, is the, you know, the sort of history of sharing metadata from you know, the beginning of time. Um, I think there's also, there's a, there's a cultural issue that's a, sort of a difference between libraries and museums in that it seems to me like the libraries, while they compete for funding within their institutions, there's not a perception that the libraries are competing against one another for funding, so therefore it makes it easier for them to work together, whereas um, there is often a perception, which is probably usually wrong, that that museums are competing against one another for, for funding, and yet you know, when you look, you know, a lot of these museums are in different states, different countries, different uh, fundamental funding sources, so I don't think the competition is what it could be, and if they work together, you know, you'd actually um, there'd be some synergy on funding. Mm -hmm. Can I just, um, I'll just follow up on that a little bit? Because I think it is partly funding, but I think there's something quite profound about librarians' commitment to working with each other beyond the institutional walls, which I think also supports that. But what I was just thinking about has to do with audiences and links to the point Ian was making. Because if you think about libraries, they, they want to connect people to the information they need. They do exhibitions, they do more kind of interpreted, curated content as well. But the balance is very different. The majority of what they try and do is put primary sources and secondary sources out, whether that's in a reading room or online, for people to do their own thing with. Whereas I think museums have a different balance and have more curated content relative to pushing things out for primary and secondary um, evidence for researchers and for the curious. So I think that has a very powerful impact now on how digitization fits into the work of a library. Um, and I think that's really interesting because that speaks to your point about what do audiences want? You know, what, do, what do the institutions need to provide to help people do whatever they want to do? I'm quite conscious from the perspective of our museum, one of the great things about the BHL, as well as working together and so on, is um, there's a stage on that sort of project where content providers are an important audience. If organizations like us don't want to put our content on BHL, it's not, going to, it's not going to work at that early stage before the audience, the external audience becomes more important. So like all of these collaborative efforts, we often look at, you know, should we continue to participate in BHL? And the answer is always yes, because it does two things. It breaks down the, it breaks down the problem for us. It's such a tight collaborative network. You can figure out who's doing what, therefore it makes our task more efficient and cheaper in the end. Also, it provides a really good product. So if we have the choice of should we 
make some um, content available and should we put it through an alternative portal? Well, why would we do that when we already have a great portal that people are using that's linking with other sources and so on? So we want to put our product into BHL because it's going to be used and it's more efficient to do it that way. Now that same scrutiny wouldn't apply to all collaborative efforts. Sometimes the collaboration is more painful than it is beneficial, <laughs> and particularly to a, con a selfish content provider. We BHL overcomes that for us, which is really impressive. Ian, um, you talked very eloquently about how this time machine of big data, if digitized and open, um, could be used in many very important emerging areas like biodiversity changes, cultural changes, et cetera. I wonder if you have thoughts about um, what the, a couple of really big emerging research ideas, basic research ideas, would be served um, by these, linking these data and making them openly available? Sure. I mean, one of the most obvious areas would be um, health. Um, human health, um, livestock health, and um, wildlife um, health. Um, everybody here, I'm sure, will be aware that um, Roughly speaking, the diseases that you get that you can cope with really well, reasonably well typically, um, in a country like America, is because we've been living with those diseases for quite a long time. Therefore, we've either biologically evolved ways of dealing with them or we've got drugs to deal with them. The things that are sweeping through countries and will eventually sweep through countries like ours will be new diseases, or at least new to humans in recent history. Um, typically, they're jumping across to us um, from other species and so on. Um, so examples of that would be things like Zika and Ebola and things like that. Very hard for humans to deal with at the moment. The information on those diseases is typically in collections. They are emerging diseases um, for humans, but they've typically been in other species for quite a long time. So there's the place to go and find the information there. In other cases, um, so for example, some of the work that we do at our museum is on some um, East African um, schistosomiasis parasites, for example, have a big effect on um, people in East Africa. We don't just have a good knowledge of um, how those parasites work, and you reveal the fact that if you want to cure pe people of those parasites, you also need to know that those parasites are transmitted by dogs and things like that as well. So you need to include that in your pigs and in the regime. Also, because of our historical records, we can go back and look at those parasites and the vectors of those parasites before we started treating for them. So we can actually track the evolution of parasites and vectors against drugs and against treatment regimes and so on. And it's, that's an impossible thing to do unless you have systematic um, collections. That's allowing us now, we're just starting three new big treatment regimes across Africa and India to try to get rid of other worm-type parasites from human populations. That's all based on being able to find those um, parasites very quickly, create collections of them, and monitor the effects of different sorts of drugs when you administer those drugs at scale. That's all natural history collections, but it's all about improving human health as well. If I can just jump in with another <coughs> example on one of the other big topics that you talked about, which is climate. There's a challenge for most of the climate models that the data go, doesn't go back in long series consistently enough. And there was a really interesting project that the British Library did, um, which I wasn't involved with, but I thought it was a really extraordinary example of where collaboration between different kinds of institutions can help. Because if you know anything about the British Empire, you'll know that they keep really good records. <laughs> and the East India Company, um, whose archives are at the British Library, the ship's logs from the 18th centuries, and well, earlier as well, but particularly 18th and 19th centuries, recorded the weather every single day for every East India Company ship, including its location. And they went all over the world. And they worked with the Met Office, the kind of weather forecasting agency in the UK, to use that as two, three hundred years of data to look at climate in the ocean and coastal areas of the world. And that's an extraordinary thing that historical documents can do if, and it's a big if, you can get the data out. It's interesting that you bring that up because I often have this conversation um, modeling the weather. We're so used to our, um, our experts being able to give us good weather forecasts. <laughs> 
That depends on data mm -hmm. and base, long term baseline data. Mm -hmm. And similarly, with biodiversity, we often talk about bi ecological forecasting mm -hmm. and what we need there. We have the tools and the models, but we need the data. Mm -hmm. And we need that long term data, just, mm -hmm. just like that example. So I'm conscious of time, and I want to make sure we take uh, questions from the audience if, they, if there are some. We have people with a microphone. Um, that was really great. Uh, I'm wondering if you, anyone has any thoughts on applications for the humanities similar to Biodiversity Heritage Library? Well, as, as the historian up here, I'll maybe start. Um, it's one of the big challenges for the humanities is finding the really big, compelling, global challenges that, that need input from the humanities. Everybody kind of knows that must be the case. But one project that I was really proud to be involved with was a project to digitize um, books printed in South Asian languages and to then use that to both allow access to information for people in what well, the pilot project was about, Bengal, so Western India and Bangladesh, but also to use that to then improve tools like optical character recognition for those languages, to improve search within those books and to really kind of open up that kind of material that's in library collections for social and economic impact, for, for development impact. And I think that, that was a, an attempt in that direction, but I think the humanities, like the climate example and like that example, don't just have to stay in the humanities. Like, we don't have to just apply history to history. And I think that's where collaboration comes in big, because I don't know without working with a scientist, what I can bring as a historian to, the, to the, the challenges that the world faces. But historians know how to think about the complexities of change over time. So surely we can bring something. Yeah, there actually is something called the um, Cultural Heritage Library that our library is involved in. But one of the differences is the, that there's a lot more complexities in the copyright sort of issues in the in the cultural literature, so that's, it's, the, the, the mass digitization becomes more difficult. Thank you. Other questions from the audience? Diane? Uh, the policy implications. You, you had that wonderful slide about biodiversity changes in Africa and with plant species. And I'm um, wondering, you said the implications for policy could be huge. Are there actually examples where um, our collections, biodiversity collections from museums, have been used to influence policy change? It's <laughs> a good question. Um, so the short answer is yes. Um, so, for example, some of the models I was talking about um, there are now used by the United Nations um, for, for their equivalent. Many of you will be aware of the United Nations Climate Change Commission. They have an equivalent one for ecosystems and ecosystem services. This is one of the indicators they now use um, for monitoring biodiversity change. So that's that kind of the, the quick answer. Um, the broader answer, though, in terms of um, finding um, really good impact studies of how collections have gone all the way through, um, either into industry or into policy, I think is something that is worth um, collating across institutions. You're probably all aware that our institutions repeatedly do that. They bring together examples and use them. The Green Book was a good example of that being used across natural history collections. That's, I think the time is almost always right to be bringing together a new version of that depending on what are seen as the big policy ideas at the moment. That would be a good piece of work to do across institutions. I think there'll be some um, valuable examples there. We've just got to be careful not to always go back to the classic ones. So I will often go back to East Africa and talk about schistosomiasis because we've got a nice track record there. You need the next one as well. You need the one that's showing, okay, this specimen is being used in this way and with respect to biomimicry in this industry with the TV screens and so on. I'm a teacher, and I am so excited about what you're doing. I taught in Arlington. We would put on our metro shoes and run here to the Smithsonian. <laughs> but we couldn't do all of it. What it did, though, was to start a base of thinking about art, music, science, and the museum in your pocket is a, an example. I really hope that there will be some teachers involved 
because there are kids in classrooms who want to know more, and the day is so short. Thank you for sharing that with us. How do you think that pro project will evolve, and will schools be truly involved in it? Not to kill the, the knowledge, but to disseminate more. Ian, do you want to talk about how that's working in, in the schools, the museum in your pocket? Sure. So what we're trying to do at the moment is, remember I showed you a picture there where we, um, of our new central hall, where we've taken a Diplodocus cast out and put a new whale in? We're using that. That Diplodocus was actually a gift from America. So I should um, thank you for that. A few hundred years ago, Andrew Carnegie gave that to us. Um, we're now, so he sent it from America to us. We're now sending it around the UK. And, we, um, and we're, taking it, um, we're taking it to a couple of um, museums, not natural history museums, but museums in the UK. Um, but we're also taking it to different sorts of places. So we're taking it to some youth centres, we're taking it to cathedrals, we're taking it to parliaments and so on. And the idea is to use this, it is a spectacular Diplodocus cast, to get people talking about natural history. Now what we're trying to do is to get the local communities, particularly through the schools, to tell us what they would like to do with respect to natural history specimens, particularly with respect to their environment. The, we'll do that in um, eight locations in the first instance, local projects like that, um, co-curated with the local communities, particularly the schools. The idea in the end is we're going to be asking them all, what would you like to do across the country? Now, okay, the UK isn't a, as big and a complicated country, a you know, continent-scale country as um, the US, um, but there's a fair, a fair few people there. So to try to get if you like, a schools-led, in our case, citizen science project, a question that they all want to work on that we can help them answer. That's how we're going to try and get into it. So that's our kind of audience analysis to say, what do you want to do with this sort of data? And we'll help you do it. So I'll report back in a couple of years' time. <laughs> OK, I think we're out of time. So I'd like to thank the panelists and thank Ian and thank you. Thank you.